What's going on everybody? It's High Peak Education coming back at you once again for another physics video, this time a lecture video on electromagnetic induction and in particular focusing on the general form of Faraday's law and solenoids and inductors, these interesting devices we often put in electric circuits. By the way, I will not perform the calculations from this set of slides, but I'll perform the calculations from this set of slides in later videos. But let's go ahead and get into it here. So let's start with our induction and electric fields. Let's make the general electromagnetic induction statement that an electric field is created in the conductor as a result of a changing magnetic flux. So previously we've said that a changing magnetic flux produces a voltage, produces an EMF. Well, that voltage divided by a resistance would just be a current. We've talked about that as well. However, even if there's no conductor anywhere in space, a changing magnetic flux should produce an electric field. Why is that? Because hopefully you recall that an electric current is charge being pushed along by an electric field. So there should be an electric field induced when magnetic flux changes in time. So as a result, we can, for example, derive, say, the voltage and the circ from the circular path length that the electric field here is minus R over 2 dB dt. Now how do you do that? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to basically say, suppose that the electric field goes round this way, then the circumference is 2 pi r. And we also know that the area of this circle is pi r squared. And that comes from Faraday's law and then also the shapes. So in general, for any closed path, the generalized form of Faraday's law gives us this. Notice the EMF is exactly the closed loop line integral of E dot DS. That is E vector in the direction of this DS vector, which would be a tangent vector, a differential vector that's tangent to this path. And notice that that's minus D phi sub B DT, the change in the magnetic flux with respect to time with a minus sign. Now notice, we put a box around this because this is, one of, this is one of Maxwell's equations. This is one of the general equations which summarizes a major component of electromagnetism. So if I've been kidding up to this point, this time I mean it. This equation is quite important. And notice that the closed loop line integral of E dot ds gives us an electric field that circulates. Notice we have not seen this before in this course. Previously electric fields we've looked at have been electrostatic fields and have been defined by conservative fields and also potential functions, namely voltage. This electric field has a definite direction to the circulation. So it has a non-zero rotation. As a result, this electric field differs from an electrostatic electric field. It's an induced electric field for one. And notice it does not start and end on charges. It forms closed loops. And notice that this is such an important point. Non-conservative work is done to move a charge over a closed path. Now, by the way, this whole non-conservative work thing may be difficult for you to understand. So what I'm going to recommend is that you go to this link. You go and watch this Walter Lewin video when he comments about how Ohm's law, Faraday's law, and Kirchhoff's laws work together. And it turns out that Professor Walter Lewin tells you why electrical engineering professors at circuits get this wrong at times. That when there's a changing magnetic flux in time in a closed loop, 
you will have your mind blown. That is, depending upon the direction you go, you won't get the same voltage and you won't get the same answer. So, Professor Walter Lewin praises Michael Faraday and I should suggest that you watch this video. So watch it from about uh, minute 33:40 till all the way about the end. So I'll pause here and give you a chance to watch that video, then I'll pick back up the lecture. Okay, so welcome back. And notice that I've always really liked this picture of Faraday. You know, maybe in the old days, like the 1800s, you can imagine these laboratories with people smoking and all kinds of smoke filling the laboratory, all kinds of amazing ideas coming to the brains. But, I mean, Professor Walter Lewin really makes a good point in this YouTube video. And that is, the true law is Faraday's law. That is to say, Kirchhoff's loop rule does not apply anymore. That is to say, if you go one direction, you get one answer that's positive. You go the other direction, you get a different number and you get a negative sign. Okay? So the idea is that, remember in the one example, if you go one way, you get positive 9 volts. You go the other way, you get negative 1 volt. And then the idea is that that's because the electromagnet was about 10 volts or something. Okay? So that's kind of the idea. Now, by the way, uh, notice that that means this is a non-conservative path. Our brains have trouble with things that are not conservative. Our brains are used to things that are sort of reversible. But this is an irreversible process, depending upon which way you go. So Faraday's law is always true. It holds for non-zero line integrals of E dot DL. Or as he calls it, but then in my notes I call it E dot DS. E dot DS equals zero if you have Kirchhoff's loop rule because the voltage is uniquely defined at every point. Okay, so please make sure you understand this. And this gets us into the idea of self-inductance. So when a switch is closed, the current does not immediately reach its maximum value. That's because of Faraday's law. But as the current increases with time, the magnetic flux through the circuit loop also increases with time. Okay. The increased magnetic flux through the coil loop induces an EMF that resists the current that flows from conservation of energy. Keep in mind, right, just like Walter Loom was talking about, as soon as there's a sudden change in the magnetic flux, there's a back EMF. In other words, there's a non-zero induced EMF due to Faraday's law, and that opposes the direction of this current pushed along by the EMF source. Well, you can imagine that um, this process of self-inductance, sometimes called the back EMF, results in a gradual increase of the current to the final value. Note, this is not resistance, but it behaves similarly to resistance as the magnetic field increases in time. So notice that, did you ever like say, turn on your dryer and you notice the lights kind of dim in your house momentarily? Okay, what's happening is your dryer is several thousand watts typically, like say 3,000 watts. So it takes a lot of electrical power. And keep in mind, the dryer is typically on a much bigger plug. It's not like 120 volts, it's usually 240 volts. So as a result, there's a huge change in magnetic flux as soon as you close the switch and start the dryer running. So what happens is the current starts running to all the electronic devices nearby, but the back EMF decreases the voltage for a moment, but once the dryer starts working a little more regularly, then the lights sort of come back to their near original brightness, okay? So there's a huge back EMF at the moment you say start a large electronic device, okay? So this is the idea of self-inductance. Now what about the self-inductance equations? Well, the magnetic flux should be proportional to the current and a value which we're just going to call inductance. 
So this is given by capital L. Now, don't get confused with symbol over usage. Capital L is not angular momentum. It's also not length. In this case, it's inductance. Okay, I hate symbol over usage, but sometimes we have to just go with it. So if there's a magnetic flux, it should be proportional to the current. So the proportionality constant is this inductance, L. Now, self-induced EMF is related to L by this. L times I is this magnetic flux. Remember Faraday's law. Now, Faraday's law has to do with an inductor. It's minus N d phi sub b dt. But notice, let's let L be a constant. So L is as much a property of the device as capacitance or resistance is a property of those devices when it's built. By the way, the SI unit for inductance is the Henry, named after Joseph Henry. It's always positive, and the amount of in, it's the uh, amount of inductance that's required to generate one volt of induced voltage when the current is changing at a rate of one ampere per second. So that's exactly what a Henry is. How much do you have uh, in Henrys? Well, that's one volt times one. Um, ampere for every one second okay so that's kind of the idea and let's see inductance depends upon how you build the thing now by the way typically these inductors are going to be coils so they're going to be looking like solenoids that is they're going to have many turns we've kind of talked about this before and they depend upon geometry size number of turns relative position relative orientation of a coil and so from the above equations, inductance can be calculated in two ways. It's EMF divided by di dt, or n, the number of turns, times the magnetic flux divided by the current. Okay? So these are the ways to calculate um, inductance. Okay? By the way, um, I should have said a moment ago that a Henry is actually a volt times a second divided by amp, because again, it would be the volt divided by a amp per second. But if you multiply that out, you get seconds per amp. And amps being amperes, the units of current. So here's another way to write this EMF. It's minus L di dt. So if you substitute this into here for the um, magnetic flux, then you get minus L di dt. By the way, you may wonder what happened to the N, this number of turns. Number of turns kind of got folded into the inductance, because again, the number of turns kind of says something about the inductance of the device itself. Now what are some applications of self-inductance and inductors? Self-inductance goes along with Lenz's law. Induction becomes more difficult with time in a shake flashlight once there's been a lot of current buildup. We kind of talked about this that this back EMF or Lenz's law comes about in that you can't just get energy for free. With that shake flashlight, the more inductance, the, grit, the brighter the bulb is, the harder it is to shake that flashlight or to turn the crank on a self-cranked flashlight. So here's another example. Turn off electronic devices before you unplug them. Otherwise, a large back EMF produces a spark. Okay, so you know this, you don't just rat yank a cord, especially quickly. There could be a huge spark, and that's very dangerous. So make sure you turn off electronic devices before unplugging them. Here's another example of self-inductance. Self-inductance is why when you start your car, the 12 volt battery sends about 36 amperes of current initially. However, soon after, the back EMF of 10 volts means only about six amps of current exists. So no inductance would cause the circuit to arc and spark, which you do not want. So think about this. When you suddenly start a car, the whole idea is you're trying to get a spark from the spark plug to ignite the fuel to start the engine. But notice that the battery has to, has to send a huge amount of current because since things change so quickly, there's a huge self-inductance and a back EMF. That means the actual current that flows for a moment to the spark plug is only about 6 amperes. Now by the way, both 36 and 6 amperes are very large currents. 
you don't want to have your fingers on those exposed wires, okay, you'd receive a huge shock and it could be fatal for sure. Self-inductance is what can produce a 100 volt back EMF with a 9 volt battery. And that's what's shown in this video right here. Notice that if you've got um, this battery suddenly turned off, if it's suddenly turned off, this bulb can go on because you have a huge back EMF. Okay, so this is again self-inductance. Interestingly, a 9 volt battery can actually produce a 100 volt back EMF? It can, if there's a sudden change in the electric current in time. Let's have a look at the potential difference across an inductor. So here is an inductor coil. Okay, imagine it's kind of like a spiral staircase. And here's what the magnetic field of the solenoid looks like. Suppose the current is going this way, like so. Notice the solenoid magnetic field is going to be in the direction to oppose if the current is, let's say, increasing with time as a function of time. If it's increasing this way, helixing to the right and down, the B field will go to the left. So the figure above shows a steady current into the left side of the inductor. The solenoid's magnetic field passes through the coils, establishing a flux. And the next slide shows what happens if the current increases. So if, the, if there's a potential difference across an inductor, it comes from the following. So in the figure, the current into the solenoid is increasing. So imagine this current is increasing in time. So notice the induced current is opposite the solenoid current. So the solenoid current is going to go, say, this way, oppose the current that's increasing. Notice the induced current um, is going to produce a magnetic field that opposes the change in flux. So I probably should have said on the previous slide that the direction of the magnetic field is the direction of the Electro, um, has to do with the direction that the steady current moves. Okay, So we wrap our fingers in the direction the current is going by right hand rule 3. The magnetic field in this case is to the left. But if the current is increasing in time, the induced magnetic field will be to the right. So the induced current carries positive charge carriers to the left and establishes a potential difference across the inductor. Remember this comes from Faraday's law. So, therefore, a magnetic field must point to the right, and the induced back EMF, delta VL, has a minus sign on it, has to be opposite the current in the solenoid. So it's minus L di dt. Now, what if the current is decreasing in time? Well, this magnetic field is now going to be to the left. It's going to boost back up the solenoid's own magnetic field. So in the figure, the current is decreasing in time. To oppose that decrease in flux, the back EMF, delta VL, is in the same direction as the input current. The potential difference across the inductor measured along the direction of the current is minus L di dt. Now notice the induced current carries positive charge carriers to the right, and the potential difference is opposite that of the last figure. Okay, so notice that an inductor kind of looks similar to a resistor in how you treat it. But keep something in mind. A resistor is uniquely defined in terms of its voltage. We can use Kirchhoff's loop rule. An inductor, the voltage difference arises due to Faraday's law. So there's technically no voltage difference across this thing. This is an induced voltage due to Faraday's law. But you can kind of almost think about these somewhat similar, at least in terms of the way you calculate this number. So notice if you go across a resistor, the potential decreases. If you go across an inductor, there's potential pushback. In other words, when you go across an inductor, technically the voltage doesn't change, but there's potential pushback because the current is, say, increasing in time, so the potential pushes back. All right, what about, um, let's see, inductor applications here. So variable inductors reduce currents in circuits. For example, a dimmer switch and a light bulb. Now hopefully you know that alternating current that's AC is in your homes and there has a certain frequency. Depending upon how you set that frequency,
and how often you're changing the current through that inductor, you can have a dimmer switch. Notice that if you change it more often, you allow higher frequency, then you're changing the current quickly and there's a large back EMF and you're gonna make this thing dimmer. Whereas if you go uh, lower frequency, then you're gonna make the bulb brighter. Now, by the way, this is what how a modern dimmer switch works. It uses an inductor. In the old days, so pre-1980s and 1970s, bulbs used to just be dimmed by a rheostat. Now, a rheostat is just a variable resistor. So when you change the brightness, if you were just, say, increasing the resistance, the bulb would be dimmer. Now there's two reasons why a rheostat is not a good idea. Number one, if you increase the resistance, what happens to temperature? It actually goes up. So that's more dangerous for your household circuits. Not a good idea. And if you increase the resistance of the circuit, keeping the same voltage, okay, you actually also going to take more power. So it'll actually cost you more. So again, modern dimmer switches use these inductors. Uh, again, rheostats for most dimmer switches have been replaced in modern times. Another example of an inductor application would be to take a high frequency alternating current and only allow low frequency alternating current to pass through. That would be a so-called low pass filter. So a low pass filter means only the low frequencies pass through. So there's definitely applications for that. You can imagine um, signal analysis and things like that. Another good example of a back EMF and an inductor would be like an electric motor, which is the subject of project number two in the class that I'm teaching this with. And another good example, a double throw relay, which is basically like a magnetic switch. Notice that here is normally closed, here is normally open. But if you have this inductor, in other words, if you change the current very suddenly, notice that this magnet switches back to here and you essentially go from one thing that's on to another thing that's on very suddenly. And a good example of this would be changing from your regular headlights to high beams on your car because you want the regular headlights to stay on constantly and then the high beams to suddenly switch on. So again, this would be called, be, be called a double throw relay. And again, we often use an inductor for that sort of application. Okay, so let's get a little bit more into solenoids in terms of them being as inductors. So you should choose an Ampere surface that encloses all the coils. Now an Ampere surface, remember, is a closed surface with an area and remember, the magnetic field kind of pokes through or penetrates. The easiest way to think about this is that if this is like a helix, imagine that it was a spiral staircase, but the spiral staircase was like a flat staircase that went up. You could imagine maybe that flat surface is a single Amperian surface. And you could imagine that's going to be, again, having magnetic field poke through it. So if you choose that surface that encloses all the coils, the closed loop integral of B dot DS is mu naught times the current that penetrates. Well, the current that penetrates that sort of, you know, spiral staircase looking surface is gonna be B times L, that's like the length of this staircase, is mu naught times N I, and N is the number of turns and I is the current. So you can rearrange that and say mu times n over l times i, and then this cursive n is the number of turns per unit length. Now, by the way, what is this mu? Now, this mu is mu naught. That's the permeability of free space. Mu is just the general permeability. Now, the general permeability is the permeability of the material times mu naught. Now, listen to me. Magnetic permeability of a material is to magnetism as um, a dielectric 
is to a capacitor. That is, remember with the capacitor we had epsilon naught, but epsilon naught became uh, the constant kappa if there was um, a dielectric. In other words, if we were in non-vacuum. If we're in non-vacuum material for magnetism, say we have like an iron core in here, then we'll change the magnetic permeability, thus changing the magnetic field and even changing the inductance of the material. So notice the inductance of a solenoid is going to be mu times n squared times a over, mu, over L. Okay, So it's the magnetic permeability, usually taken to be mu naught unless otherwise told, that would be like vacuum, times the number of turns squared times the cross-sectional area divided by the length of the solenoid. Okay, so I will perform this example in a later video. How about the self-inductance of a coaxial cable? Here's a calculus example. Suppose you wanted to calculate that inductance of a coaxial cable. So what is coaxial? They both have the same center of these cylinders. And we have an inner radius A and an outer radius B. So the way you would do this is you'd want to integrate with respect to radius. Here's a little bit of a dr, radius sliver. You want to integrate out from A to B. And what do you need to integrate? Well, you need to integrate B dot dA because that's the uh, total magnetic flux, okay? And then you want to integrate this in terms of the expression for magnetic field. That's mu naught I over 2 pi R. That's the magnetic field for a straight current carrying wire. And then dA, this area is a little dA, this sliver, and that's length times dr. Well, notice that mu naught I over 2 pi times L, those are all constants. And then you have the integral of dr over r, which is the natural log of r, which is the natural log of b minus the natural log of a, which is natural log of b over a. So this is the expression for magnetic flux. Therefore, the inductance is the magnetic flux divided by the current. So you divide this by I, you get mu naught L over 2 pi natural log of B over A. So notice you can calculate inductance for various geometries using a little bit of calculus. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. And now let's talk about circuits that have inductors in them. And I performed an intuition video about this namely an LC circuit. L being inductor, C being capacitor. So, we first use Faraday's law, not Kirchhoff's law, as Walter Loon would say, because we can't use Kirchhoff's loop rule because Faraday tells us that the voltage across this inductor has to be zero, because it's just a piece of wire, okay? So the idea is that I mean, the voltage here is only due to the fact that there's a back EMF. So the closed loop integral of E dot ds is minus d phi sub b dt, that's minus L di dt equals Q over C. That's the uh, voltage change across this capacitor. You can express this equation in terms of a charge Q of t, that's the charge on the capacitor as a differential equation. Remember I, which is the current, is dq dt. So you can write this as the time derivative of dq dt, and that's the second time derivative of q with respect to t. If you divide by minus l, you have minus 1 over lc q, and that's equal to d squared q over dt squared. Now, hopefully you saw the intuition video. You saw that the charge basically bounces between both of the capacitor plates. That's because the form of this differential equation looks exactly like a simple harmonic oscillator. Remember, a simple harmonic oscillator, like a mass with a spring, frictionless, or a simple pendulum, has this equation. d squared x by dt squared is equal to minus omega squared x. Notice that the omega, which is the angular frequency now, is just going to be square root of 1 over LC. And notice that that's going to be the angular frequency, so we can solve this equation. 
Thus, the charge and the current on the circuit oscillate back and forth between the capacitor and the inductors, alternating which stores the energy in which field. Suppose you start with the capacitor initially charged. Well, then Q here is going to be like a cosine function. Imagine that it starts at its maximum value. Notice that that cosine function is going to oscillate that um, a quarter period later, all the energy is going to be stored in the magnetic field. But then another quarter period later, all the energy will be stored in the electric field again, but the polarity will be reversed of the capacitor. Then another quarter period later, the current will be going the opposite direction through the inductor. And again, energy stored in the inductor's magnetic field, and then back to the starting position of energy stored in the capacitor, same polarity at, as at first. So notice the solution to this differential equation is like, is Q of T equals Q max cosine omega T. Now what's omega? For the harmonic motion, the natural frequency, which is the resonant frequency, which is the angular frequency of this LC circuit, is 1 over the square root of LC, L being the inductance, C being the capacitance. Notice that Henry's times farads and the square root of that and the reciprocal gives radians per second. Who knew? Just what it turns out to be. If you want the frequency in hertz, you need to take the angular frequency and divide by 2 pi, so it's 1 over 2 pi square root of LC. So, this is how we work out an LC circuit. Now, by the way, the initial discovery of electromagnetic waves was made through the use of an LC circuit because all the energy was stored in the electric and magnetic fields. I'll talk about that here in just a moment. But when the capacitor is fully charged, it's like the spring being fully elongated or the stretch being full and there being full elastic potential energy. Just like here, there's full capacitor potential energy. A quarter period later, the current is changing in a function of time, and when the inductor is charged, it's like a spring moving with maximum kinetic energy, since the inductor depends upon the current. Okay, so there we go. And then another quarter period later, the capacitor is charged to its opposite polarity, and then another quarter period later, the current is now moving, in the opposite direction of before and the energy is stored in the magnetic field of the capacitor. So we go from stretched to equilibrium position to compressed to back to equilibrium position but moving the opposite direction and then return. And this of course just keeps cycling through because this is a simple harmonic motion. Now let me say a little bit more about those electric fields and magnetic fields stored in an LC circuit. Imagine you're living in the late 1800s, and suppose you're working with Heinrich Hertz. Hertz, the German physicist, whom which we named the unit of frequency, Hertz, after. So since charge and current oscillate in the LC circuit, the electric and magnetic fields oscillate. It was Hertz himself that showed these have wave properties. Hertz's experiments used an induction coil, a transmitter, and a receiver that had the same resonant frequency as an LC circuit to detect electromagnetic waves. So let's have a look here. Here's an input and an induction coil and a transmitter. Now over here we have a receiver, but notice this receiver is receiving a um, electromagnetic wave because Notice that it's picking up the same frequency that this is oscillating at. So think about this. Hertz was able to transmit electromagnetic energy over air. This is pretty amazing. He wasn't transferring electricity, but he had found electromagnetic waves. And the electromagnetic waves he had actually found were low frequency radio waves, okay? So here's an important application. What you do is you take a variable capacitor and you basically tune it. In other words, you change the capacitance and you change it to a certain resonant frequency and you receive the corresponding radio station, 
transmission frequency. Notice that I've said before in these lectures, some of the things of this world seem so complicated, but what you're doing is you're basically sliding these contacts in and out of a variable capacitor, and when you change the capacitance, you change the resonant frequency, the resonant frequency should be tied to the frequency of the actual radio station transmitter, and thus you predominantly have that particular radio station, and you can listen along to your tunes. That's it! Notice that some of these things in the world that seem so complicated can really, in their essence, just be boiled down to things that we can understand. So an LC circuit is essentially a radio transmitter. Here's a, again, you're tuning a variable capacitor to a certain resonant frequency, and this is what it looks like. Here's another very important LC circuit application. I'm going to assume most of you watching this video own one of these. You own a cellular phone. Now, most of the time these days they're called mobile phones because we have multiple cells, we sort of have networks and so on. But a cell phone is actually just a very sophisticated two-way radio that communicates with the nearest base station via high-frequency radio waves. Now keep in mind, these high-frequency radio waves, when you hold the cell phone up to your ear, it's uncertain if this affects your brain and your biology. Basically, it's definitely higher energy than radio waves that come into you know, radio stations. So I would not necessarily recommend holding a cell phone to your head, but I've not seen any conclusive studies about their effects. Um, so I would recommend maybe a headset or Bluetooth or something. But as in any radio or communications device, the transmission frequency is established by an oscillating current in an LC circuit. Now, by the way, I really like this picture because it's a nice clear photograph, high resolution, and she's holding like a flip phone. Now, by the way, I love holding on with these flip phones. Some of you may still have flip phones out there, but I'm assuming most of you just have flat kind of touchscreen phones. Um, I remember my mother-in-law had a flip phone that barely worked after using it for 12 years. She'd hang it on a string around her neck and she would say things like, you know, I took it into the cell phone store and the person told me it's not supposed to last that long. And she said, mine has. So anyway, stories of my wonderful mother-in-law. But anyway, we all have our cell phones and I'm sure many of us spend way too much time on them. Okay, let's talk about a different kind of circuit having an inductor, namely an RL circuit. So a resistor and an inductor. What's going on with this circuit? The current uh, through an inductor, like a solenoid, cannot be turned on or off instantaneously. Since a magnetic field is built up, energy is stored in the inductor. So an RL circuit is a circuit containing both a resistor and an inductor. Okay, so imagine we have an EMF source. Let's have a resistor let's have an inductor, and let's have a switch, okay? Keep in mind, this resistor could be like a resistor network. We're not looking at, for the sake of this class and this lecture, inductors in series or inductors in parallel. That gets pretty complicated. Now, with a switch closed, it takes time for the current eventually to reach its final value of EMF divided by R according to Ohm's law. So when the switch is first closed, the current changes very quickly in time. So the inductor has a high induced EMF opposing the current. But as the current gets near to its final value, which will be given by Ohm's law, the current through the inductor is changing slowly, so the induced EMF due to the inductor goes to zero. Now when you switch on an RL circuit, you apply Faraday's law, not Kirchhoff's loop rule. This is so important. A lot of textbooks get this wrong. Do not get this wrong, okay? So, what's the direction of the electric field? Well, it's opposite in this battery. It's along the direction of the current. It's zero through the inductor. So when we work this out, we have the closed loop line integral of E dot DS is minus D phi DT is minus L DI DT. And that's minus IR going along with the electric field, but then plus the EMF. Okay, now notice that if we've gone just this way, you can imagine it's 
plus IR because we're going with the current, but then they're going against this electric field, so minus EMF. But then that would be the same direction as um, a positive, you know, sort of, so make this positive, just get the opposite sign. Okay, so that's what we get when we use Faraday's law. Solve this differential equation for the current. Now, by the way, notice that this is a first order linear ordinary differential equation. So notice that uh, you can solve this in your differential equations class. I'm not gonna show you how to solve it. I leave that for you in a calculus class. But if you solve this differential equation, um, it's actually not so difficult to do. You have to multiply through by something called the integrating factor. You can integrate both sides using the inverse of the product rule, yada, yada, yada. You get this logistic growth equation, so you get this. That the current as a function of time is EMF divided by R, 1 minus E to the minus T over tau RL. So what is this? It's voltage divided by resistance times the quantity of 1 minus the natural exponential raised to the minus time over this RL time constant. Now what is this RL time constant? It's the E folding time, sometimes called the characteristic time. The characteristic time for an RL circuit, this is, remember this is not a torque or anything, it's the um, inductance divided by the resistance. So Henry's divided by ohms is seconds. That's how the units work out. The time constant is longer to reach the final current when the inductance is large and when the resistance is small. Let's think about why this is. If you have a large inductance, it pushes back very hard, so it takes a long time to get the current to its maximum value because of a large back EMF from the inductor. Now, if the resistance is small, it should take longer. That is to say, it takes a long time because if you have a, a small resistance, you're going to have to build up to a large current. I mean, the final current that you need to reach is very large. So you can imagine, essentially, you have to have a large current for the final current. Remember, the current is EMF divided by R. And that's just given by Ohm's law. So that's our asymptote. So a plot of current as a function of time. Here's our horizontal asymptote given by Ohm's law. Notice that after one time constant, we've reached 0.632 of the final value. And 0.632 is 1 minus e to the minus 1. Remember, e is the exp. That's the natural exponential, Euler's number. So remember, Euler's number is approximately 2.71 and some change. And yeah, so basically 1 minus uh, 2.71 to the negative 1 power is about 0.632, okay? So that's the characteristic time, and here we have um, that for the time constant. Now remember, we never actually fully get to this asymptote. I mean, theoretically we don't, but usually after four or five time constants, we're less than 1%, um, and usually we just say good enough in practice, in real applications. Now keep in mind, this is a charging RL circuit, but charging means storing energy in the magnetic field, okay? So that's what we mean by energizing here, in terms of these mathematics. Now how about if you're discharging? Now when you're discharging, technically that's de-energizing this uh, inductor. So there's energy stored in the magnetic field of this inductor, but we're gonna throw the switch from point A to point B. Again, we use Faraday's law. So it's minus d phi dt, and that's subscript B of magnetic field is minus L di dt, and that's plus IR. The plus IR means the current goes in the opposite direction it originally was. Now this is a first order linear separable ordinary differential equation. You can just divide the i down here and multiply the dt over, l and r are constants. So this you should be able to solve using calculus one principles. So you can solve this differential equation by direct integration. And when you directly integrate this, you get exponential decay. This should hopefully make sense to you. At the moment you close the switch, the current is huge because there's a lot of energy stored in the magnetic field. And this inductor pushes quite hard, but after 
a period of time, the current's going to exponentially decay with time. And notice that we start off with Ohm's law, EMF over R, but then this exponentially decays down towards zero. So if you plot this as a function of time, it's exponential decay. And remember, discharging means energy leaves the magnetic field and transmits into the resistor and is dissipated as heat or light or some other um, form. Okay? Notice the time constant, the characteristic time, which again is the E folding time, is still L divided by R, which is units of Henry's divided by ohms, and that gives units of seconds. Remember, tau here does not mean torque, it means characteristic time. Okay, I hope that makes sense for RL circuits, resistor inductor circuits. Here's an example in which I will show the calculation in a separate video. How about energy stored by inductors? The circuit at the right had the switch thrown from A to B. Suppose it was in A for a long time and it carried current EMF divided by R. When you throw the switch to B, the current keeps flowing in the resistor even though a battery isn't in the circuit. The only other element in the circuit is the inductor, so the inductor must have stored energy, again, in the magnetic field. So the rate at which the battery supplied energy to the inductor is EMF times I. You can integrate this equation to find the energy stored by the inductor. Well, notice that you should be able to say power is the change of potential energy with respect to time. And then the EMF is the inductance times the current. And then notice that um, if you have uh, L D I D T, that's EMF, I should have said, and then I is also here. I is just this I that's right here. So notice that when you integrate both sides of this equation with respect to time, you should just get the um, energy stored in the magnetic field, that's capital U of B, and when you integrate I D I D T, you get like I squared with a one half in front. So the energy stored in an inductor is one half L I squared. So this is our equation for the potential energy that is the energy stored in an inductor. Notice it depends upon the inductance, but it depends upon the square of the current through the inductor. Here's an example of a coaxial cable. Remember that coaxial cable before we calculated the inductance? I think that was mu naught L over 2 pi natural log of B over A. If we insert that in, divide by 2, and multiply it by current squared, this is the total energy stored in the coaxial cable. There it is. How about energy density of electric fields and magnetic fields? The energy stored in an inductor allows us to find the energy density of a magnetic field. Using values of inductance and magnetic field for a solenoid, the energy density of the magnetic field, and I say energy density, I mean energy density in terms of energy per volume. So that's why it's units of joules per meter cubed, is gonna be this expression. Now I'm not gonna derive this expression for you, but notice that this holds in general, even anywhere in free space, magnetic field squared over two mu naught is the energy density. Again, you derive it from a solenoid, that's the easiest way to show, but it, it holds in general. Now, if you recall from a capacitor, we could derive the energy density in the electric field, that's joules per meter cubed. And again, we have one half epsilon naught, remember that's the permittivity of free space, whereas mu naught is the permeability of free space. And that's one half epsilon naught times E squared. This is the electric field squared. And this is valid for any situation, not just solenoids, which are inductors and capacitors. Now notice, we're going to use these two expressions at some point later to figure out how they go into electromagnetic waves. Remember the experiment by Hertz with capacitors and inductors, that is with LC circuits. So the energy in the electric fields and the magnetic fields definitely relate to these equations. And again, I will sh 
calculate this um, in a later video. Okay, so I think that ends this lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Please smash that like button if you enjoy this content. Please subscribe to the channel to grow the channel. Please share this amongst your social network and I look forward to your comments in the video. And thank you for watching High Peak Education. I will see you in the next video.